one. Okay, here we go. What's up, everybody? My name is Danny, and thank you so much for joining the light side. I am here with one of my friends, mentors, whatever you want to call him. His name is Frazier. He's an online coach. He taught me so much about, um, I guess, vegan bodybuilding. He was like the first guy that I reached out to, the first person when I was getting ready for the Arnold as a vegan. I was like, hey, I am doing this. My heart, this is what my heart wants, but I'm freaking really scared. What do I do? And I would send him what my coach was sending me and was like, hey, is this okay? And so I'm really excited to bring this conversation to you because, um, We've been connected for a while, and this was a big, huge turning point for me, and he was a big, huge push for me to go through this. Um, so, Frazier, freaking welcome. Thank you, and thank you, for the, thank you for the awesome introduction. And it's, it's a pleasure to be on Lightside. Um, we have so much to talk about. You know, I feel like it was – I remember back when you came to me and – you know, coming from such a, like a hardcore bodybuilding culture, like, you know, even myself, like to hear people like are curious about veganism, that was, I'll never figure that experience that I had with you. And, you know, one of the things I just wanted to share with you that I haven't even, I don't think I've even told you was I always remember when you said something like, you know, after all of this time, I enjoy just eating strawberries because for years and years and years, like strawberries just weren't part of my competition prep and I just forgot what it even was like to like to live. And I was like, that is so cool. You know, like just, just around strawberries, like there's such a deep <laughs> philosophical notion around a strawberry. <laughs> yeah. There was, I remember that moment I was done competing and I had a bite of a strawberry and I was like, this is not bad food. And when I was not on prep, it was Oreos. Like it was just totally left field. Whatever was not prep food is what I yeah. wanted. And fruit was like the last thing. And then I had this epiphany and I was like, oh my God, strawberries are amazing. Like I should be able yeah. to eat these every single day. So I remember that too. <laughs> That's cool you yeah, brought that yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. And gonna, I'm excited to jump in and dig into all kinds of interesting stuff. Ah, me too. So, So why don't we just start with like, your story because your story is pretty amazing and like yeah. a big like polar opposite. <laughs> yeah well for your listeners uh, I used to be a butcher um, I was a hardcore meat eater so I wasn't you know you have some people who who eat meat but they're not like hardcore into it so they could go without it for a few days and not notice that was not me <laughs> I was like breakfast lunch and dinner guy um I, I had such a different lifestyle back then, Danny. I, I mean, I don't even know how much I've told you, um, but I came from a life where I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, severe social anxiety, ADHD. I was that kid in school who was getting, at one point in time I was trying and I was getting A's for effort, but I was getting D's and C's for achievement. So I felt even more stupid because I was like, here I am with A's for effort, but I, my achievement levels were garbage according to the, you know, traditional school system. And that kind of drove me down this path of thinking my intelligence is hardwired. I am not a very smart person. So why don't I just quit school and go make some money. And so I left, I was probably one of the youngest people out of my peer group to leave school. I left when I was just almost 16. And I went and I was working part-time in a butchery after school. I just fell into that job. I, I went to get a job at one of the local supermarkets and they just happened to put me in the butchery. I didn't ask to be there, I just fell into it. And I was like, you know what, what is the easiest path to getting a full-time job, I'll just go and ask my current part-time job for a full-time job. And so I did that and I just fell into that. And from that, I went through an apprenticeship where I had to go to slaughterhouses and see the whole process unfold. I was heavily involved in the industry. I worked in the largest butchery in New Zealand. So I saw a lot of things uh, that at the time didn't even stop me from eating meat. <laughs> oddly enough. Uh, and I had really bad problems with alcohol and drugs, prescription drugs, and just illicit drugs, but mainly prescription drugs. Um, and 
I really, really struggled. Like I really struggled with a lot with my mental health, with my life. And it was only once I started seeing my therapist at the age of about 21. So I've been suffering through this for years and he suggested that I go to the gym. And it's funny because back then, I say back then, like we're like old people, <laughs> but, back, but back then, I mean, YouTube was like in its infancy. So people weren't posting, you know, workout videos on Instagram and stuff like, so I didn't have anyone to model from. I did, it wasn't like you just follow people on Instagram for workouts. I had no one to really model from. And I was, so I had not been exposed to the fitness industry where I could see that there was value in it for my mindset. And I was like, why would I want to do that? Like in my back then, I didn't understand that working out could make you feel better mentally. I didn't even understand that, that factor. And I was like, well, he's helped me with so many other things. Maybe I'll just give this a shot and see what happens. And so I started working out. And one of the things that I found was that I didn't, I wasn't in a hardcore bodybuilding gym, but it was more of like a commercial fitness gym. So there was a range of people there. And I found that I started to befriend a lot of people that were a little bit older than me. So at the time, being in my early 20s, I was befriending people in their 30s and late 30s who had children and families and they were business people and they were healthier to start with. And so I started to sort of being around them, that association really did rub it off on me. And I went back and I studied uh, nutrition and human structure and function and personal training. And after that three year degree, I came out the other end of it. And basically it was just a series of progressions to where I am now. And so like one of the things that I often say to people, you know, you hear these beautiful stories about how people have these like instantaneous turnarounds where one minute they're a drug addict or an alcoholic or something. And they have this moment of awakening where everything shifts in them. I didn't really have that. It was almost like a, a cascade of moments. It was, it was, stepping stones it was it was layers to the experience where i would sort of transcend one level and i would stay on that next level for a while and that still wasn't really who i was and i'd transcend to another level and i just kept kind of climbing these these rungs of ascension to the point now where where i am today having been vegan for seven years and you know alcohol free and don't use prescription medications drugs um just really changed my world and i really enjoy so many things that i never used to even pay attention to uh, like personal development learning being in nature a lot of the things that i think that you value in life and i didn't i never stopped to take take inventory of that when i was younger i was so busy caught up in trying to just impress people and accumulate things that i thought would make me look better or get me um, social recognition that that I felt even worse because it put, it drew people into my life who didn't even value me for me being me. And I felt like I was constantly having to put on this sort of mask. <laughs> and so for that reason, uh, having come this far and now, and, and this is all back in New Zealand. And then now having lived in America for eight years, uh, I have my wife, Lauren, who is from here as well. And then we have a little girl, Zia, who uh, is turning two uh, very soon. So it's been, a, it's been a crazy journey, you know? And so for me coming here to meet her through all that anxiety that I, I'd spent years dealing with, that was probably one of the biggest accomplishments in my life because I th for anyone who's had bad anxiety, they know that it's so hard to like even get out of your house sometimes, let alone, you know, go to someone else's house or, or leave the country. Uh, and so it was really, it was just a leap of faith into the unknown. And I just, in my head, I was, I just thought to myself, you know, if this doesn't work out, it's okay because I will learn so much from it. And if it does work out, it's okay because I will learn so much from it. And so that's, that's the sort of, um, compressed version <laughs> of the story, really. <laughs> okay and so what was like the aha the vegan aha moment where you were like i cannot eat meat anymore yeah so that's funny because a lot of people would think okay you talk about being in the butchery and seeing all these gross things that you saw 
uh, while you were in there, uh, you know, cancers, tumors, and just all kinds of really gross stuff that we would hide in the ground meat and do all kinds of things. And that didn't even deter me. I just didn't eat those certain things. Like I was like in my head, I was like, well, I'll just kind of eat a work around those things, not recognizing that the whole thing to me really was the issue. Um, what really changed me was when my wife, Lauren got this book called the world peace diet by doc, Dr. Will Tuttle. Um, she got the book because she was looking for spiritual text that re related to like food and, and, and how humans see themselves in the world and animals and the food that they consume. And is it living food for like a living body? And so we would go out to her grandmother. We would drive out to see her grandmother every week. And it's about a 30 to 40 minute drive out to see her. And so every week she would get this book out and read a, a few chapters for 40 minutes in the car while we were driving out there. And it just kind of slowly started to like seed in our mind. She was already much more evolved down the path than I was towards this. She was one of those people, like I was saying at the start, who wasn't a ferocious meat eater to start with. She would eat a little bit of fish or eggs, maybe chicken every now and then, but she wasn't touching pork or red meat or anything like that. Whereas I was, I was eating, a, I was eating two to four chicken breasts a day, like six to 12 eggs. It just, you know, you know, the typical, like a really heavy meat based bodybuilding diet. And I, thought to myself when I was this, reading this book, when she was reading this book, I felt like everything that he was saying was in alignment with the, the, the values that I held. It was in alignment with the way that I thought I saw myself in the world. But the thing that he sort of shone light on was how I thought my values were there, but my actions maybe were contradicting the way that I was thinking. And I didn't see that. Like I did not, I did not see that. Uh, and that's why I have a lot of sympathy and empathy towards people who are new to this journey or new to veganism or haven't been there yet, because very often it's like, it's, it's ingrained into us. And I, I listening to that book, I was like, you know what? Everything that he said just makes sense to me. And I thought, why don't I just do this? Like, why don't I just give this a shot? What can I lose? Like by trying this. And it was in that moment, I was like, you know what? I'll just start adding meals in. So I started adding plant-based meals in to crowd out all the old foods. And over a period of four weeks, I would integrate in, you know, a, a plant-based meal and replace an old meal. And by the fourth week, it was just removing some eggs from my post-workout meal and replacing it with tofu scramble or just anything. And once I did that, it was like effortless for me because I feel like in my head, I had made the decision of who I wanted to become. You know, like I'd already made that decision of who, what my identity was first to the point where I, I wasn't being pulled back to that old life. Like once I made the decision physically to change out my meals, there was no pull back because I was already identifying as someone different. I wasn't identifying as that person who loved meat so much anymore. And so that's, that's where I came from, you know, and I've never looked back since. And I, I'm one of those people, I think I'm like you where I don't, I don't jam it down people's throats. I don't, I'm not really, I'm not combative about it. I am friends with a lot of people who aren't vegan yet. And I share it from a place of compassion and non-judgment because one, I don't like that being directed to me. And I don't feel like that, I don't, that just does not work for most people in my experience. That shame and judgment is, all it does is in fact just repels people. And I think it reinforces their current viewpoint more. And so I've really, part of my journey into veganism also kind of was a journey into human psychology as well. Understanding the human mind, like understanding my place in the world, understanding how we think, understanding the, the condition patterns that we have and maybe that we cannot see that. And it's not that we're bad people. We're just operating on taught behaviors that we think are normal. And so it was this, it was this crazy awakening, you know, and, uh, 
I, I remember when you came to me and you know, your motivations and I was really just happy to hear the, the compassionate aspect that you had to wanting to, to try this because I feel like that is a huge building block in making people make this a lifestyle because that value is really deep. You know, that value I think transcends bodybuilding. It tra Cause like at some point in time, no matter how good a shape like you were in or I, I was in, as we get older, that body is going to change. But those values that we have will not change. They, they remain strong. And if you're anchored to just how you look as the, the bearing for like everything you do, you'll always be chasing this, this mirage unless you have like a deep value system. And I feel like that was something that I really worked on with, with myself. And even in more recent years, you know, I, even within veganism, there's a lot of people who eat a lot of vegan junk food, for example. And I, at the start, I was one of those people. Like I, I was like a whole new world for me. I was like, wow, this is cool. There's all these things to experiment with. It's fun. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I wasn't even that healthy. So I was eating like more processed vegan foods. It was only more so even coming into our daughter being born that I really then wanted to get as healthy as I could because then I recognized now that it wasn't just me about me, like carb loading tons of vegan donuts and then going to deadlift 600 pounds, you know, in my head, in my head, I was like, I can eat all this junk food because I'm going to go train for two hours and I'm going to go lift really heavy weights and I'll literally burn enough calories that I won't gain body fat from doing this, but you know, it's not healthy. And I recognized then once my daughter was born that I don't want to be one of these guys who's, big and strong but you know has the heart of like an 80 year old when they're in their 40s and so that really compelled me that was like a whole other layer of ascension where i really then took my diet and my lifestyle to a whole other level of of cleanliness so to speak because of her because of my daughter you know so yeah oh there is so much in there I don't even yeah. know where to start. The, well, I, oh, well, the daughter thing, I'm just stuck on that for a moment. Um, <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> and you. she's like a little sprout. She's like a little vegan baby sprout. And how has it, well, there's some stuff I want to come back to, but how has it been raising a daughter vegan? Yeah. A baby. It's, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the benefits that we have had is that because we are nutritionists, we don't, we don't get a lot of kickback from people because people know that this is our job. And so for that reason, they're like, okay, they've probably researched this and they probably know. Whereas I know that for a lot of parents and, and people who are curious about this, who don't have the nutritional background, they can get a lot of kickback from doctors and from pediatricians and from their family who are just concerned, but they just don't, they don't know. They don't have the knowledge I find that a lot of the mainstream health system tends to be like 10 or 20 years behind. Like the, it takes that long for things that are subculture to become mainstream or like known and respected in science. And there's such a big lag time. And so things that we're learning and we're doing are still like barely understood by a lot of pediatricians and things like that. And a lot of them don't study nutrition. Most, most, you know, most doctors, most doctors and pediatricians and things like that don't study nutrition. And so for that reason, they don't really have a lot of knowledge there. So we were fortunate one that we already had this background and that we'd spent a lot of time learning about it all before while Lauren, Lauren was pregnant. And it's not been hard for us just because this is our lifestyle and we want to show her like a compassionate lifestyle and we want to show her a healthy lifestyle. And, you know, it's nothing against my parents or anyone's parents for that matter, who, who raised us as not vegan. They didn't know as much back then. I mean, the internet wasn't even a thing. So there was, you were in a, in a very small ecosystem of people you could get your information from. And my diet was terrible as a kid. I mean, it was, it was just like a standard American diet. It was like fried chicken and pasta and mashed potatoes covered in butter and cheese. And just like lots of starchy white vegetable carbohydrates and processed pastas and chicken, fried chicken and stuff. And so for me, 
now looking back and knowing where I came from, but having the hindsight of the knowledge I have now, I enjoy being able to see her develop tastes and, and, and enjoyment of these like really healthy foods. So that's the, that's been the biggest thing for us is that because we've raised her this way since the start and we, we give her very little processed food. I mean, she doesn't even eat seitan. She doesn't even eat really like plant-based meat alternatives. Um, it's like a whole food plant-based diet. And she, and she loves broccoli. She loves like just eating things plain for that reason. And so I feel like for us, it hasn't been challenging just because of the background we've had. I can understand how it could be difficult for some people. Um, but I honestly feel like having seen her development and her level of intelligence and how healthy she is, it really instills in me the belief that when done right, this way of living and eating can be really, really healthy. Um, you know, really healthy. And even the American Dietetic Association states that, you know, a well-planned vegetarian or fully vegan diet is suitable for all stages of life from pregnancy, um, you know, infancy, lactation, all the way through to elderly adulthood. And so if the American Dietetic Association is coming out with that official statement, you know that they've done enough research to be able to express that. And so it's really been a cool experience for us. And I have actually found that because we wanted to give her more whole foods and more even healthy foods, it's helped us eat healthier as well. Because we knew that if we were eating more like vegan treat foods and stuff all the time around her, it's kind of not fair. Like she'd see us doing that, but she's not allowed to do it. And so like, we didn't want to be like that. We wanted to more model uh, like what we wanted her to do through our own actions. And so we're really conscious of that. So she's been a little teacher for us from that perspective of like, Okay, you know, model, model what you want to her to see, model what you want her to do through your actions, not through just saying it, you know. So yeah, it's been it's been a roller coaster of a, an adventure so far. Good, good. The little sprout. <laughs> She's yeah. so adorable. And I was yeah. seeing your um some of your posts where you would post her plate and actually yeah. post like what you guys were feeding. And I think that is so helpful for people who are curious yeah. about this path or just want to maybe incorporate this more. So I really even though I don't have a daughter yet <laughs> yeah. or a kid yet, I really appreciate your content and posting what you yeah. feed because that's something that I have a question about too. Yeah. Um, and I want to go back to the compassionate thing. So yeah. yeah. Compassion was like my main reason uh, other than health and other than my career. And I was like top of my game and yeah, I got there yeah. and I was just like, yeah. and I threw out all of my meat containers backstage at the Olympia. So my, <laughs> it was very dramatic. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hello, so my transition kind of happened like, bef like getting ready for the Olympia. And I was like, AJ, I need to switch my diet. I'm like, can we do tofu instead of turkey? And he was just like, Danny, you have the biggest show of your life coming up in eight weeks. He's like, can you just get through this? And then we yeah. will fix this after. So I had already been like cooking Ian a bunch of vegan food, just, you know, testing it on him. Yeah. And, um, and then after I went, after I, after the Olympia, I threw out all my stuff backstage and I was like, I'm done. And I never had meat other, like that was like my last bite, moment. I guess. Of yeah. meat. It was, it was a big moment for me. And in that moment, veganism or just eating not meat became more important than bodybuilding and my compassion yeah. for the animals and for the world became more important than being Miss Olympia and and I think that was just my my first starting to turn around and be like wait what am I what am I doing what, and what yeah. am I doing this for and so all of these questions started to come up and I remember you telling me you were like sometimes when people go vegan a lot of other things in their life start to change. And that is exactly yeah. what happened to me. And it was just like one thing after the other, like you said, like layers and layers. And then I was like, I don't know what to do like with my whole life. And yeah. it was crazy, but compassion was the one thing that drove me and still does today. Yeah. And I love how you said that you don't like blame people or you don't come at them because there's nothing to come at them about. They just don't know yet. They just haven't been, they haven't seen or haven't related like the animal thing, like the beingness of your dog and of your cat is kind of the same thing as the cow and the chicken, you yeah. know, it's, and then once you see everything as one, you're like, whoa, like for me, it was like a whoa moment of, I love my dogs. What's so different about this cow? And now yeah. when I see cows, it's even tough to like, imagine that people don't see it that way, but they do. And there's nothing wrong with it. And I love 
I also need to comment on the fact that you said you don't shove it down people's throat. And that's great. I'm not a big fan of that either. I was actually already had given up meat and I went to a bodybuilding show an expo and people vegans were at the top of the stairs with a fucking sign that had some shit on it. Right. And yeah, I'm like, man, yeah. I'm like, I agree with you, but like the way that you're doing this is no bueno because yeah. even people who agree with you, you're triggering me right now. Like, I don't really want to see that. And, yeah. but it, like, I, I think a better way to do that would be to go into the expo, have a booth with an awesome protein, a vegan, yeah. awesome protein bar. Right. Versus like pissing everybody off with the sign. <laughs> or even, or even better is like, go compete and like get on stage and be a walking billboard for exactly what you want people to model. Yes. You know, like put in the work and yeah. don't just yell at someone, expect them to, to change, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'll say like, you know, having seen your evolution, it's, you're a different person um, in so many ways, but you were all re I could see like you were a different person now, but you were, were that person back then too. You know, I could see that in you back then. And, that one of the common themes that, like I said to you, is that so many people who come to this lifestyle, especially when they're heavy into fitness, is they often have all kinds of other things that almost become a feeling of turmoil in their life at first, but it's like growth. So like if it's like growing pain. So it's like all these conflicting feelings and like these anxieties about like, what am I doing? What's happening? What's the best decision moving forward? And early on, it can feel like it can feel worse before it gets better. And I remember, I think from memory, you were going to, you were about to prep for the Arnold and then you stopped uh, because you just got to the point where you felt, I almost felt like you, you were transcending this need to compete. You were transcending this need to, to, to compete with people. And I understood that, you know, I understood that. Like I, and I could see that in you, I could feel it. And I've seen that in other people as well. There's been other people who have come to me and they've started down the path of like, I, I want to compete. Like I need you to dial in my, my macros. And then as they go, they're like, man, I just don't know if I, I feel this anymore. And I'm like, look, it's, there's no right or wrong answer here. Like you do what is in alignment with you. Um, but having seen that, that transition in you, I feel like definitely that compassionate part was what was fueling that, you know? Yeah. Yes. And you're so right. Just the need. I was like, I don't really want to compete. I don't want to like, just my fire went out and I don't know if my fire was ignited in another area of my life. And I wanted to yeah. explore compassion and yoga and meditation. And I really wanted to explore another side of myself that I hadn't been yet. Yeah. And yeah, you're totally right. Like the, the need to compete and, and just compete was just yeah. like, yeah. And people don't understand that. Cause there's so there's, there can be so much rigidity that comes with it. It's, I mean, I, I know the dedication that you put in and that's required at that level where it's, it's cardio, it's daily weight sessions, it's tracking everything, it's tracking how much water you consume, it's, it's saunas, it's tanning beds, it's supplements, it's day in, day out, day in, day out. It's going into the gym and leaving nothing on the floor every single time you go in there. And it's so there's so much rigidity, like while at the same time, it can really cultivate a lot of discipline and character. Like it really can make you, the discipline can really transcend into other areas of your life. But at the same time, the rigidity can almost become like a prison where you never experience anything outside of that. I mean, some people can't wrap their head around how we could, or I would want to travel in an RV around the U S and like work out outside the RV. They're like you don't go to a gym. And I'm like, all I, I mean, I've got some adjustable dumbbells. I've got a barbell, which is more than a lot of people have when they're camping. Um, but even for me, that was a huge test because I was even a creature of habit. You know, like I was that creature of habit as well, where I would be at the gym at the same time every day, my sessions mapped out, ready to go. And everything was rigid. My meal timing was rigid. Like I'd, I'd be stressed out if I couldn't like have my meals at certain times and I would take my food everywhere with me. And I'll be honest, I still take my food everywhere with me now, but it's for a different reason. It's because we eat the way we do, which is different than most people. And I don't want to be eating just conventional processed junk food and stuff like most people, but it's not from a bodybuilding you know, perspective anymore. It's from like an optimal health and values perspective but yeah it's it's definitely uh, the it taught me so much just about shedding while well, while still having routines and habits allowing flexibility between some of those 
So you can have structure and routines. That's, that's good. But having some flexibility to move between those structures and routines, I think is everything. Like if your whole life's so rigid, I mean, could you even have seen yourself moving to Colorado back when you were in the heavy um, competing era in your life? You probably were like, I need to stay at the gym that I'm at. I know exactly what grocery stores are nearby. I need everything exactly the same, you know? And so it can keep you captive. Like if you, if you go down that path too far, you know? Yeah, dude, it's so can. And freedom, that was my word. Like yeah. when I quit, I was just like, I literally want to be free. I want to be free. And the, it first started with my sponsors. And I was like, I remember that, yeah. Quitting. Yeah. And then yeah. that felt so good. And they, they didn't have any vegan protein. They came out with a new yeah. bar that had every single freaking animal in it. And I'm like, I can't was, get behind that, this. That was Red Kong 1, right? It was. You know? And I remember we went back and forth because <laughs> you, you would ask me, you're like, oh, what do I do? And I'm like, and I, and I just try to, I would just try and guide you, you know, like I didn't want to tell you what to do. Um, but I remember that and it's hard, especially when a, a supplement company has no vegan, uh, products and you're there trying to promote it. And then all of a sudden you feel like you're not being authentic with your audience because you're promoting something that you don't even use or that you feel like is not even like what you want to be doing. And it's, it's hard, that conflict, that internal conflict. I mean, what I admire about what you did was that you chose to align yourself with how you wanted to feel. You know, a lot of people might be really stressed out about the money and be like, I need that support. I need that sponsorship. I'm just going to do it for that reason. And it's not even knocking people who do that because I understand that not every, you know, some people are really struggling financially in certain areas and they're trying to do what they can, but you'd have the courage to step away from all of it. Just kind of have a knowingness that you'd figure it out, you know? I just trust it. I'm like, this feels right. And how could compassion lead me in the wrong direction? But yeah. money sticking yeah. with my sponsors because of money, I could, that could go down real quick. Sticking yeah. with bodybuilding because I want status and I want identity and I want whatever bodybuilding I thought was going to give me. And, and when I shed the sponsors and then I shed bodybuilding and I was like, oh my God, it doesn't matter how much cardio I've done. It doesn't matter how much <laughs> carbs I've eaten. It doesn't matter who I posted about today. And I was like, I was free <laughs> yeah yeah it's, yes. it's 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 almost like you all of a sudden realize that this the, all the things in your life that you thought were holding you back were literally just thoughts in your head they're not even real things it's not even a physical prison you're in you're not you're not at house arrest yeah. but you put yourself in this mental house arrest where you feel obligated to do these things because of the social media following you might have created and, and what, they, what you think they expect from you uh, and the expectations around that and who, you, who they think you should be and all these things. And, and it's hard. I mean, that's, it's all part of, and that's one of the hardest things that I think with a lot of men in particular when it comes to adopting veganism is that they're hunters, they're fishermen, they barbecue with their buddies uh, and tailgating. They do all these things that connect them to other friends that involve behaviors and habits that all of a sudden they feel like if they're not part of that, they're going to get ostracized and judged and, and told that they're, you know, they should go back to doing what they were doing. And I think that it's that, that mental model that's really challenging for people to break. And I'm just fortunate, like for me that, I, I would train in the gym and, and I would push myself to, to limits in the gym early on that other people would watch that and they would be like, okay, like I can't compete with that. So it was like a respect was earned through me, like destroying myself. Like I was such a masochist with my training that people would see that and they're like, okay, I'm not going to try and tell him that he needs to eat meat. Uh, and so it was like, almost like, respect out of like destroying myself physically now it's more just like almost like it's like a, a need to not even like try and compete with anyone about anything or like prove people wrong um I, even in, even in today's climate right now with everything that's happening with COVID-19 at the time of this podcast there's so many opinions about everything and so I often think to myself like Sometimes an opinion 
isn't sometimes adding another opinion isn't the solution. And that's why I don't to always throw my opinions out there because I'm like, it's not, is this just an ego thing? Like, or is this, you know, is me adding this actually going to help people or is it just going to stress people out more? Like, so it's like that with veganism. It's like that with, with that growth of just letting go and, and knowing that the people who are ready to learn and transform will find you. You know, even to this point now, I'm not as big as I used to be. I'm not as strong as I used to be. I still train really hard. I'm still into gym training, just not to the extent that I used to be. And, but even to this point now, I still have guys will reach out to me. And when they're ready, they're, they're ready. Like they're open-minded. They want to learn. And it's just about attracting those people. Like rather than going out there and trying to like convert everyone who's not even ready to change their life yet, just put your message out there and you'll have people who are open-minded and ready to change come and find you. you know? And that's enjoyable. Like that's so much less stress. <laughs> Yeah. Weird. Yes, it is. And there's no, there needs, there doesn't need to be any combat. And I love how you said that earlier too. And people just come to you and they're ready and there's nothing. And I feel like even the word vegan, yeah. people get like a really wrong idea about, and then they're like, whoa, but if you say plant-based, they're like, oh, okay, I'll listen. But like, yeah. And, and so I don't even like to, sometimes I don't like to even refer to myself as a vegan because it automatically people put up the shield and they're like, free hugger hey like they just like yeah. don't even want to hear it yeah um i'm so I'm, 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 I, I'm like selective with how i say it so i kind of get yeah. i kind of gauge people yeah. so I, I get a feel of like what is their motivation and like what is their perspective on it and then i kind of use the wording that i feel like is going to resonate with them yes. so they so they understand where you're coming from yeah. uh because then if you're speaking their language and meet them where they are they're much more likely to be like open like you said they're not gonna like close out and shut down and and and, and freak out and so i think definitely choosing your vocabulary based on you know the person and the intuition that you get is, is so important you know it is it is just to leave that channel open and like accepting for both people yeah um so earlier you talked about kind of like the mental health stuff that you went through yeah. Did you notice a big change when you started switching what you ate? Yeah. And it, it was interesting because it wasn't just from like a lot of people would think, and, and I know this to be true for a lot of people is that I've helped who have come from, you know, a standard American diet or even a, a conventional bodybuilding diet. And they were struggling with mental health issues and we would get more micronutrients and we would clean their diet up and we would add more diversity of foods into their diet and they would massively improve their mood. And so I've seen that happen with people. And I think part of that is they're just getting more micronutrients, more vitamins, more minerals that create better hormone precursors and better chemical responses in the body. And so for that reason, their body's just literally optimizing. So they're putting better foods into their body. And so because of that, they have less inflammatory responses having in their brain and because of that they feel better i i felt like for me it was almost like the more i guess the consciousness part of it where i really started to explore my own mind more and i and i started to recognize that if i could change things like this about my life like my what i eat my lifestyle all these huge things in my life like what else in my mind is changeable. Like what else can I, can I alter? And I really started to look at mental health differently. And I started to, to feel like mental health and my bipolar diagnosis and my, all these diagnoses that I got and all these medications that I was on, was on for about 10 years. Um, it wasn't hardwired into me. Like I used to, there was a point in time in my life where I thought that the mental health issues that I had were genetic like just solely genetic. I'm not arguing that there's some mental health dispositions that have maybe genetic tendencies, but I think environmental aspects, like, so I think there's a lot of things that drive mental health. I think one is definitely your environment. And so you can have someone and if they're a really positive person, but they're in a terrible environment, their mental health will suffer. Um, likewise, if you take someone out of a bad environment and you put them and they have a lot of mental health problems and you put them in a really good environment, they will thrive. And I've seen that and I felt that myself. And I felt like early on, I thought that me being this way was just something I would have to live with and suffer through for the rest of my life. 
once I started to recognize the power of nutrition and the power of personal development and removing alcohol and, and negative people from my life and all these other things and getting out in nature more, um, I really started to recognize that mental health wasn't so much this thing that was hardwired in me, but it was just like a state that I was stuck in. And so I was stuck in like this negative feedback loop of dysfunction. And I found that the food definitely did help improve that. It had definitely, I've noticed for a lot of people, it can help reduce anxiety. It can help improve sleep. Cause you know, if you've ever had really bad sleep, that really affects your mental health and mood. And so I noticed that for a lot of people, if their sleep improves, their mental health massively improves too. So that's another thing that was really powerful for me that I noticed was a big improvement. But beyond that, it was just me starting to recognize that everything about the way I think and what I thought to be true to this point is something that I can change. And I know that not everyone has that perspective. There's a lot of people out there who think, you know, if you're bipolar, you're going to be stuck with it. And that's just what you've got to deal with. And I've even had, you know, even at times when I've shared my story about having these diagnoses and being on medications for years, I've had people say, well, that's really nice for you, but I, but insert story. Like, it's really nice for you, but I, this is, this is just the way I am. And I, I'll never. And so like, and I'm like, look, if that's your story, that's fine. But at the same time, I think there's power to knowing that there's so much about ourselves that it's just learned habits and behaviors or things that we've thought about long enough that have become like a unconscious system. Yeah. And, and I definitely feel like for me, there was a huge benefit with the nutrition. Um, but more so it was just like, it was almost like a confidence in knowing that, okay, if I could get off all my medications and walk away from like all those mental health diagnosis and I could get off all the animal products and walk away from that old lifestyle, like what else can I, what else can I walk away from? You know, what else is possible? Um, and you really almost, you get almost get like ambitious. Like you start looking for things in your life that you want to, to open up and change. And I think, you know, you can probably attest to that where you started to do this and you're like, man, this, this feels right. It feels good. And then you're like, now I'm curious about yoga and I'm curious about Colorado and I'm curious about all these other things. And you're like, maybe I want to open up this door and open up this door. And so like it really, and you almost get a courage. I think you almost develop like a courage that, okay, I've come so far and I've overcome so many things that I thought most people would think I would not overcome. What else can I overcome? Yeah. You know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. A courage is such a great way to put it. Um, yeah. Cause in a way, like I walked away from a bodybuilding career that was pretty good, pretty promising. Yeah, um, yeah. And then I switched my whole identity like on Instagram. And I think that's what a big, I had like a two year hiatus where I was like, I don't know what to post. I don't know who I am. I don't I know if I'm, that. oh my yeah. God. I, Cause I didn't know like, and I didn't want to be not authentic, but then once yeah. you're like, all that matters is your authenticity. Yeah. And it was people, almost, it was almost like you were like that caterpillar and you were in the cocoon. <laughs> like changing, trying to figure out what type of butterfly you're going to become. And in that two, cause I noticed in that two year period, like you just sort of like step back and, I, and I'm sure that people were asking you all the time, like what, what's happened? Like, what, what are you doing? And then coming out of that and changing your, you know, social media name and changing your message. It takes a lot of courage to do that. Cause I feel like, especially if you've already built a large audience, they, you might feel like they expect a certain thing from you and to then have the courage in yourself to say, okay, you know what? Like I, I appreciate that you might value me for these things, but this is who I am now. And if you want to come along with that journey, you can. And if you don't, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to, I mean, it, it, it's challenging for a lot of people to do that. Like a lot of people, I don't think would have the confidence to, to do what you did. It's still tough and I'm still kind of going through it. Like yeah. even now that I'm posting now more and just kind of coming into my new light and being really excited about this, I am losing followers left and right. Like 20,000 yeah. followers have left my Instagram and like, I'm trying not to be upset about it, but yeah. it's like tough because you're putting in, you're putting in even more work now than I did before when I was bodybuilding. And yeah. now it's like down another thousand down and but 
I have people that are also messaging me that are saying, oh my gosh, I went plant-based because of you. And now I'm living a more compassionate lifestyle. I'm meditating more. And like, yeah. I liked you as little monster, but I love your transition. I love you <laughs> now as light side. So yeah. I'm getting really individual, like beautiful messages from people, but it's still tough because it's like, yeah. because I'm not naked training on Instagram, people yeah. are dropping off. And it's like, when I think about it like that, I'm like, okay, that's fine. Go. Yeah. Um, but it is. But it's, I, I, th I think it's hard because you pour your heart into this new message and you hope that people will understand and, and value it. And it's and one of the things that I've realized now is that it's like, if you and Gary Vaynerchuk talks a lot about this and he's like, post what you want to post based on what you love and value and the right people will start to find you. And, and, and because like, you'll have a shedding, like just how like you shared a lot of the things in your life that is a shedding of people as well. It's a shedding of followers that come with that. And I feel like it is, it, it, it's not always easy. Like it's not, it's definitely not always easy. I mean, I've even noticed that like with the message that we share more now, whereas before it was like hardcore vegan bodybuilding. Now it's more about vegan family and op and, and peak performance like how do you how do you feel really good like how do you have better energy and more mental clarity and how do you have all the things that allow you to have a conduit for a better life with your job with your relationships because nutrition and training and all these things they do massively dictate some of these things and so now for me, like that, that's my thing I enjoy because I've had to learn those things as a parent now to become even more efficient with my time because I have less time to spend. And so I need to be way more intentional. So how can I create an environment in my head where my concentration and my energy levels are really, really good? And it comes back to nutrition. It comes back to lifestyle. Now, not everyone is there. Like a lot of people, they don't understand that. They don't necessarily value that as much yet. And some people do. And at the same time, I feel like not everyone values like, you know, family stuff, vegan family stuff. Um, but there's a lot of people who do. And I think, I, so I completely understand where you're coming from in terms of that transition and that shedding and recognizing that. And I've, and I've even thought to myself, there's been people that have played really key roles in my life like chapters in my life where they were like really close they were like really avid supporters of what we did and then they kind of drift away and, and we and we part ways and one of the things that i learned from brendan bashard and he kind of talked about it where people not everyone is meant to be throughout every chapter in the book of your life like there's many people who will come in and they might have a starring role in like one chapter of your life, or they might have a starring role in a couple of chapters of your life. And then they go away and they write other chapters of their life where you're not in it anymore. And it's not a good or bad thing. It's just is what it is. Yeah. And I really focus on that now where I'm like, that person was just a chapter in our lives and that I hope they go on to have a good life, but it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. And so I try and remember that like with any transition and I think for any of your audience listening to this and they might be contemplating any change, whether it's veganism or whatever, that it's important to remember that because it's not just about food or it's not just about what we think it's about. Like you were saying, when I told you early on, when you, when you walk down this path, so many other things change in your life as well. And it really is like a mass shedding. Like you really do lose so many parts of yourself that you thought were important and they just really weren't, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I tell it to my clients too sometimes, because as they start to like, like reach a new vibrational level or they start yeah. to kind of up level it, whether it's even just like it's beginning to meditate and they don't see the same, they don't have the same views that their friends have. And then they're like, I, you know, and then they're like, we're distant. And it's like, it, when you go to a different vibration, some of the friends that were on that old vibration, they're still there. And you're yeah. just, you know, you're on a different whole trajectory now and like attracts like. So why would yeah. you attract those friends who are still stuck? Yeah. And it's, and, and you know, like for anyone listening and they're even uncertain about the energy stuff, you know, when you're around people and they, they bring a really good energy and you leave the conversation and you're like, wow, that person was awesome. Right. Like they were like, they, they made, they actually gave me energy. Like I left that conversation and I feel more recharged 
after that conversation than when I came into it. Whereas you also know people where you go into the conversation and you leave and you're like, Oh my God, I want to go home and drink a beer. Like, (laughs) you know, like, 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 Oh my God, you know, like, so, and sometimes it's family. And so like that, that energy like is a real thing. And I think that like you were saying, part of it is getting people to recognize that about their environment, you know, and to understand that because you've had, I've had people come to me and I try to just stick as much as I can with nutrition and training. But when I can see that they're like a hot mess and they're rushing through life and their nervous system is constantly aroused. Cause I use like a lot, I use a lot of data tracking methods as well. So I, I have like a real spiritual side like you, but at the same time, so I have this thing called an aura ring. Okay. You've probably heard of them before. It's like a data tracking ring. And what it does is it tracks things like heart rate variability and heart resting heart rate and your sleep patterns and stuff like that. I can see when people are getting stressed because their readiness score goes down and their heart rate variability drops and their resting heart rate goes up and their, and their breath, their respiratory rate increases. And there are people and you, I try and give them, you can give them the best workout plan and best diet plan, but if their nervous system is constantly stressed and they are not doing anything to manage their mind and calm themselves down. Mm-hmm. That stuff is not going to work as well as they want. It's not going to. It's not going to be as optimal. So, and that affects hormones. It affects neurotransmitters. It affects everything. And so, I try really hard to make people realize that, hey, like this is not just about what you eat. It's about the energy that you bring. It's about are you slowing down. And, and detaching from social media and are you are you actually getting good sleep and are you taking time where you're not training like i probably like you used to train so hard and i would i was in there six days a week push pull legs strength hypertrophy split like just deadlifting, like squat every freaking heavy compound that you can think of drop sets super sets rest pause sets everything <laughs> And, and I would never want to take any time off because I was like, one, I just want to eat food. I was, like, I was like, I just want to eat so much. And so like I would overtrain as a way to like mitigate the, the calories I was taking in. Yes. And, the, and the other thing was that like I just enjoyed the training at the time, but I never gave my body a chance to recover. I was like constantly breaking down. And then I wondered why my sleep was terrible and my blood work was terrible and I had brain fog and I had like no energy. So I needed caffeine all the time. And it's like, sometimes you need to step back and like, they used to meditate and get out in nature. One of the things that I think is so cool about you living in Colorado is how much just the nature there, it, there is such a therapeutic quality to getting out in nature. And it's not even, there's a scientific validity to that as well. So literally being shown in science to calm down nervous system response, decrease blood pressure, decrease resting heart rate, decrease sympathetic nervous system activity, just by being outside in nature, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's why for us traveling in our RV, that's, we made the decision now. We were like, you know what? We're going to go up to Gatlinburg in Tennessee because that's beautiful mountains there. We do want to get out to Colorado as well. Um, but like, I was like, I just want to get in nature, you know, for, for, for our daughter, for ourselves. Because I understand that that alongside nutrition, that's probably, I would say, as effective or more powerful than even nutrition sometimes, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it's because nature has like this beautiful, just unconditional love kind of vibration. And when you get out there, you can't help but like it vibrate into you. And I think the Chinese. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's true. And I I think the Chinese actually have a term called forest bathing where. I've heard that. Yeah. They like, they, they like go walk outside. It's kind of like a walking meditation, but I don't know that it's so much the meditation as it is the nature kind of getting into your cells and doing its thing. Yeah, like you're bathing in that energy. You're bathing in that that fresh air, that sunlight, that microbiome that is out in nature. Like, for example, like uh, the Smoky Mountain National Park in Tennessee, it's the oldest microbiome in the United States. It's something like 80 billion years old. And so basically a lot of people's health problems come from just poor digestive health, from being inside and recirculating AC environments, taking lots of antibiotics, you know, just things like that, like pesticides on food, everything. 
and getting out in these like really prehistoric uh, microbiomes is actually a way, the way to repopulate your digestive system outside of just eating foods. So you can actually repopulate, you can actually get, people will be taking probiotic supplements. You can actually go out and sit in a forest and get probiotics in nature. That it's, it's, that's, I mean, there's a power to that, you know? God, I knew it. Yeah. And, <laughs> I and knew you know, there was something to it. And, and you know, the beauty, you know, the beauty of it, Danny, is that maybe not everyone knew the science, but they mm. knew it, they knew it intuitively. So like, you don't have to be a scientist or you don't have to have read research papers to intuitively know this is good for you. Yeah. Like, so there's people have been doing this for hundreds and thousands of years they may not have known what's happening on a chemical level, but they know intuitively that it's good for you. And I feel like, and I feel like, you know, you can take that same concept a lot with a, a plant-based diet and you look at, you know, when you when for example, like there's that whole kind of concept around like with a child, you know, if you put a, a, a chicken or an, 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 a farm animal with a child and you put like a carrot or an apple in there, they'll typically, they'll eat, I mean, all the time, they'll eat the carrot and the apple and they'll play with the animal. And so I think intuitively it's that instinctual nature of like what we really want to do. But I think adulting and becoming an adult, it kind of teaches us otherwise. It trains that out of us. And often it's just getting back to that. You know, it's getting back to that origin, you know? Yes, the nature yeah. origin. Oh. So yeah. the, the reason why I moved to Colorado was actually like my sister was living here. She just moved back uh, to Cape Cod with my parents. Yeah. Um, but she was living here. So she was like my pull out here, but it was like family and nature. And yeah. I didn't know why I had no, I no plans of doing yoga, no plans of anything, but had you ever I, been to Colorado before? No, we drove her out here. We were okay. here for a day and dropped her off and then flew back. Yeah. But no, I hadn't, but I, what <laughs> all I knew was nature and in Florida, nature's really nice, but you can't, yeah. You like ride bikes outside like you literally melt off your bike and you're like this it's, is nasty it's hot and humid <laughs> oh, yeah. and you're like breathing like through a washcloth <laughs> yes and it's like I, great it's like yeah. really pretty but i'd like to be in my car in my air-conditioned yeah. car <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and and here there's just it, like it's everywhere like there's there's mountains there's swimming there's everybody is on their bike like the soon like any day above 40 people are on their road bikes yeah. and 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 there's so and there's no competition there's yeah. no rush. There's no, there's so much that comes with nature. And like, now I realize like, that's literally what I wanted. I was like, nature, why'd you yeah. move to Colorado? Nature <laughs> yeah. still is. Yeah. I feel that pull. Um, when we go to Gatlinburg in Tennessee, mm. like the Smoky Mountains, it's the same thing. So like the temperatures are a little bit more mild. It still can get a little bit humid. Um, but it's just being in nature. There's something about that, you know, especially, coming from my background and your background where we were so routine orientated and we were so hardcore for a while. And we, and even coming from that background of like having so much anxiety in my life and having so much depression and, and bipolar tendencies and things like that, I feel like the, the diet and, and the lifestyle and all those things are important, but the getting into nature is as important as well and, and you know like for us like we really want to make that a priority for our daughter too so we know that we know how important that is for health in general so we really want to get her out in those environments as much as possible early mm -hmm. so it, it so it just becomes part of her lifestyle um that's one of the things that i i, I feel bad for a lot of people who maybe went vegan and they have children already and they've already taught them different habits. And now they're trying to like undo all of that. It's the same with getting out of nature. It's the same with anything for us. If we teach her these things from the start and it's just normal to her, it's just like part of who she is, then it's not something she's consciously got to like force herself to do because it's just who she is. And so, and so we we take her out, you know, even right now during this stay at home sort of uh, suggestion, we'll take her outside two or three times a day and just get her out in the backyard and, or in the front yard. And she's just in the grass and in the sun and we'll take her little shirt off and she's just running around with her little pants on because we want to get, you know, the, the sunlight on her skin and all these different things. Yeah. And so it's definitely, you know, for me, the whole vegan bodybuilding thing has really evolved 
into just this, like, how can you live a better life? Like, how can, I still think you can have both. Like, I still think you can be a really good bodybuilder and you can be a really good vegan bodybuilder and you can still have a lot of balance and flexibility. But you just need to be willing to test and experiment with things. You know, like, you can't be so rigid that, like, I've got to hold on to this way that worked. And, like, what if I change things now and it, it goes worse? You know, a lot of people, you've probably seen it. A lot of people try a plant-based diet and then they start to like freak out because maybe they're like holding a little bit of water retention or something. It's like something really small and minor and it's like in week one and they just, they just panic and they just go back to what they were doing. Um, and I'm like, look, like don't see those things as bad things. Just see them as biofeedback cues where it's just telling you what's happening in your body. It doesn't mean it's not good or bad. It just means that you just need to adapt things and keep experimenting till you find the right combination of things for you. And it's that experimentation. You know, it really, it, it comes down to having the confidence that you can experiment and find yourself, you know? Yes. Yeah. And I, I was actually going to mention something like that too, about how people who go vegan and then they, are get sidetracked so easily and i don't know if it's because their reason for going vegan is like oh i want to be more healthy like yeah. we do unhealthy things all the time that's kind of an easy thing to revert back to but when like the compassion switch goes off and you can't kill anything anymore you're like yeah. i don't even care if this makes me unhealthy so yeah. i find that the reason sometimes people go vegan are maybe it's trendy or yeah. whatever they want to lose weight i feel like those are not stickable Things. that's that's definitely a thing that i've noticed and what i and i and what i suggest to people mm -hmm. is i'm and especially if they come and they're, they're doing it for health reasons i'm like that's great like i want you to do that but don't stop learning just there keep yeah. learning about all the other reasons like there was a guy recently his name's larry hagner and he uh he's a podcast called the dad edge podcast where he talks all about fatherhood and parenthood and things like that oh. And, and so he, and, and his podcast is really geared around like manly men. And, and so there's a lot of guys in his masterminds and things who hunt, who fish, who eat meat. Anyway, I'm in there as well. And they, I never get any like disrespect. Um, and I said to him when he started doing this, I was like, look, don't just stop with the diet. Keep learning about all the reasons why you should be doing this. Like look into factory farming, look into, you know, sentient animals and understand the comparison, you know, and I, and I said to him, like, have you seen the movie, the matrix? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, you've got to recognize that like so much of what we think is reality and true is literally just like this matrix of ideas that have been imprinted into us that have been told that is normal. And when you can step back and see that and be like, Oh my God, like I, you know, cause like people might have judgment towards people in China for eating dogs and cats, but we're doing the same thing at our end. We just don't see that because we're inside the fishbowl. We're the fish inside the fishbowl. We can't see out. We can't see in from the, you know, we don't have the perspective. And so it's like plugging yourself out of the matrix. And I said, learn about the environment, learn about the environmental impacts of doing this because you have four young sons and I know that you want to see this world a better place for them. And I know that you want to be a healthier version of yourself for them. And you want to lead them with a better set of morals and values. So don't just stop with the nutrition, learn everything. And I said, cause like for me, why not attach all these motivations to do this and really thrive? Then just have like one reason, you know what I mean? Like, one reason could be very flimsy. It could break quite easily. Yes. But, and especially, I do think that you need to hook into the compassionate and the environmental aspect of things. Because I think once you do that, your, your ability to find solutions with the nutrition will go up. Like you won't, like you won't just eat um, beans one day and get really bloated and be like, okay, I feel really bloated right now. I quit. You know, because like people, people have done that where they're like, okay, I feel, I feel really bloated. And part of it is like, look, if you go from eating 40 grams of fiber a day to 200 grams, because you're eating all these like plant-based foods and your gut microbiome is not pre prepared for that, you might feel really bloated. 
And so from that perspective, you need strategy and you need to be patient and you need to not just like throw everything at this straight away, reduce down some of your insoluble fiber a little bit. Don't eat such massive plates of salads and stir fries, you know, like reduce down those portions a little bit of the, of your insoluble fiber. Cause that otherwise people get like the bloating. That's a common one. And then they stop because they don't have the, the deeper driver to figure it out. They're not, there's not like you were saying, you made it that decision in your head at Olympia. You're like, okay, I'm done now. And even if you got bloated and even if you got, even if you broke out with pimples or even if you went through a period where it like felt worse before it felt better, you're like, you know what, this, this is not part of who I am anymore. So going back is not an option. And I actually find that it's that burning the ships mentality. Like I often use it. Like I, I have a lot of sort of like, uh, like, different types of thoughts in my head. And it's like, you know, that movie, like, uh, like 300, right. The, the, the Spartan warriors are in like the hot gates and there's 300 of them and they are going to defend their city to the death. And they're not turning back. There's no retreat. There's no surrender. There's no plan B. There's no way out. You figure it out or you die. You know, you figure it out or you die trying. And so like, my whole thing is like, find a way to figure these things out. And now in my head, I adopt that mentality with everything I do. I'm like, I burn the ships. Like I found that when I've given myself plan B's and like exit strategies, my ability to execute on the, the goal is never as good. And so if I say, you know what, I'm going all in with this thing and I will figure it out. I can tell you there's, there's been power to that. And I really try and get people to embrace that mentality with their diet and stuff. I'm like, look, go all in, know that you will figure it out. If you are patient, if you are methodical, you will figure it out. And it's the same, like it's the same with anything. You know what I mean? Look how far that you came. You came from eating, you know, a, a conventional bodybuilding diet at the top of your game. And you drew that line in that sand and you were like, you know what? I'm not turning around again and I'm not going back that way. That's, that's a chapter in my book that's closed, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, dude. I- and it's so funny that you talk about the bloating and going back. So like two months after I went vegan, I got married. Yeah. And two, so that was like post-show bloat. I don't know what to eat. I'm watery. My cheeks are fat and I don't, <laughs> and there was all of these, all of these huge changes going on two months after I decided to go vegan. Like I wasn't sure about my body and then yeah. even like our food. So my sister and her boyfriend, and then Ian and me, we were all the only four vegans at my wedding. (laughs) But when I planned my wedding, I was not vegan. So I had a Brazilian meat situation happening. And you know, all all of my friends are bodybuilders. So they loved that. But all of us, we all had like the salad and the cake was vegan. Yeah. I, I got it to change that. You got, you, got, you got to figure that out, right? You cannot skip that. <laughs> Just not going to tell anybody about that. Yeah. But they're like, yeah. oh my God, awesome cake. Um, but that's one of those things about not shoving it down people's throat too. It's just like, hey, yeah. this is what I'm going to do. You enjoy that. I'm going to enjoy this. But even the thing, like I was getting ready for my wedding and my body was kind of bloated, but there was like, feel like, no can I turn- fit into my dress? Like, what am I going to look like in my pictures? Yeah. And, yeah. Totally. The whole thing. And there was totally like stress around that whole, like, you know, if if I could go back, I'd like wait a year and get through that whole thing. (laughs) But now I see the transition I was going through and like my stomach and I was like, and I know how to control my food and my body and my diet. I used to two months before this whole thing. (laughs) Um, But that was one of those things where I was like, I'm not changing it. This is how it is. And I'm just going to, I'm going to go through this all at the same time. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and there's, I think there's a power to just, not shying away from a challenge, especially when you have so many other things coming your way. It's kind of like, you know, that, that saying, like when it rains, it pours. And it's like, you could look at that as a negative thing and be like, Oh God, when it rains, it pours. Like, I'm just going to like, Oh, quit. Or you can be like, you know what? Everything is coming my way right now. What if this is just like on the cusp of just massive breakthroughs and changes in my life? What if, what if I'm just like breaking through this, this, barrier that I cannot see, but I can feel it. And it's just really taking me to my threshold. And so I, and I, and I think about that a lot, you know, I, we go, there's many challenges that we've been through in in my life. Like, you know, from back when I told you being a butcher and and dealing with all of these things and, 
and the mental health problems and the addiction and breaking all those things and then having the the addictions shape shift into other addictions so like the addictions shape shift to shape shift from you know abusing prescription medications to alcohol to then becoming like a a trainaholic in the gym and like overeating and like bodybuilding and it like morphed from that addiction into a more socially acceptable addiction and and then i started to see that for what it was and then i'm like holy crap like my addictions just didn't go away they just like transmuted to something else and it was like this whole whole awakening of of everything and and it was like going through those points where it was painful. Like you were saying, like you feel like everything is being thrown your way and you're like, how much more can I, can I take? And I feel like those typically are the tipping points in your life where if you keep going, you like have massive breakthroughs. And even to this point now, um, I'll be the first to tell you, like with our daughter Zia, she's definitely what we would consider like a high needs child. So she's just very loving, but she can be like really emotional. And she wants, when, if she gets upset, she'll want us to hold her all day. And she's it's very intense. And that's really can be really emotionally draining for, for us. And so to juggle that with business and fitness and health and life and not having, and not having room for yourself, right now anymore like we used to those challenges can come at a lot and then you add like you know COVID-19 in the mix and all these other things and it's like you can feel like there's all these things testing you and again it's perspective it's like looking at it and saying you know what like what if these are just all like points where I can break through and I and I stick to that because I uh, the, the alternative is not appealing right? The alternative is like being miserable. Like I don't choose to be, I do not want to be miserable. Like I feel like, and I've said this to other people that it's okay to be upset and it's okay to be challenged, but don't pitch a tent there. You know, don't, don't stay there. Like you're going to experience like all the emotions, but you don't have to stay there. You know, you have to have tools and resources and strategies to get yourself out of those holes and move yourself in those positions. And like, that's why now I'm such a psychologist fanatic and just so into personal development and personal growth and, and psychology, because I understand that changing your life and your habits and your, and, and, and reaching another level of performance in your life, just in anything you want to do, isn't just, it's like not just something you do like once a year. You don't just go to like a seminar and get rah rah up and then leave and you're in the, that state for the rest of the year. Like you have to do these things like brushing your teeth, having a shower, drinking water. Like you have to do them as daily practices. And I recognize now like sunlight, nature, fresh air, even vision boards and daily mantras and things that you say to yourself and watching your vocabulary and the words that you use and what you're taking in through social media and mainstream media, like all of these things, you have to be intentional about it all the time, all the time. So like, I find that if I start slip, slipping and slacking on things and I start taking in too much like negative media, whether it's social media, mainstream media, YouTube, whatever, to try and keep up to date with current events and I start getting like nervous, it changes my state. And I feel like that's not good for me. And so I need to step away from that. And it's the same. Sometimes I'll feel like, okay, my diet was a little bit more processed than normal. Like I'm at a point now where most people would consider my processed diet really clean and healthy, but I'm looking to like, like just keep going. But even when I look at that, I'm like, okay, it's been a bit off the last few days. I don't feel like my energy is quite as good. And so I have to keep like auditing myself and keep, asking myself like who do I want to be not just allowing like circumstances of life and what's happening around me to kind of dictate what I do you know and so like I really try and share that with people like people will come and it's it's funny because when they come to me about a vegan diet and I give them all kinds of like mindset stuff and, and habit formation things. They're like, what is all this stuff? And I'm like, this is the stuff that's going to make the diet work. You know, like unless you are a hardcore bodybuilder who is already disciplined and you can just implement things like clockwork, which most people aren't, you probably need the mindset stuff to make you even implement the diet in the first place. 
you know, like most bodybuilders, you know, like you can give them a plan and they just like follow it like a robot, like robot. And it's like no deviation from it. Whereas a lot of people are not like that. They, they, they struggle. Like their life is this constantly changing thing in flux. And if you, you, I've seen before, I've created like these beautiful nutrition plans for people that in theory would like be amazing. And they would, they, and the, and the people really struggled with it. And we had to adapt a lot of things because their lifestyle, their mindset, their perspectives, we had to work on those things before we got this stuff refined. And so it really is this multifaceted thing. You know, it's like I started my journey back when I did my degree. That was just like just about nutrition and it wasn't even about plant-based nutrition. And now it's like, I feel like more of a psychologist than a nutritionist because I recognize that the mind is like the, the, the gateway, you know, it's like the, it's like the captain of the ship. You can have that, that map, but if the ship is, if the, cap, the ship's captain is drunk, he can't follow that map. And you know, he's going to sail that ship into the rocks, even if the map's perfect and the boat's perfect. Um, and so I think that is just a really important thing to, to know you know, and remember. Yeah, hundred percent. Nutrition coaches are also life coaches. Yeah, because because food can take on so it can be like your friend. It could be like an emotional eating pattern. It could be like whenever one thing in life goes off, it's like oh well now there goes the diet. So it's almost like how do you keep people's nervous systems and minds at bay so that they can still follow their diet? Um, Yeah, and I wanted to. mm -hmm. I know, and I was I was just gonna say like, for you, did you find that? were you good at eating to a plan methodically or did you find that it was challenging for you? Like when you were in the height of things and you were doing really well with bodybuilding, was it challenging for you or did you find that you were just able to like implement just like bang? Yeah. yeah. I was pretty, pretty, pretty robotic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, then, and, and, and you know what is even more challenging often with that is because when all of a sudden you have a big life change like veganism, it's even more traumatic because you you were so you were so rigid like there was so much execution and rigidity around what you were doing and it was working too that's the thing it's like not only was it rigid but it it's, it was working and so i think people's biggest challenges is to change things like you know there's the whole saying like if it's not broken don't fix it but that mentality i think can pe- can keep people stuck because if, if you think about it, like something just because it's not broken doesn't mean that it's good. It's just, it's just the absence of, of being broken and being broken is perspective, I think as well. So you could look at someone and say, okay, that person's really rigid and methodical with their diet. Um, but your perspective might be like, to me, that looks broken. Like that looks like they, that looks like they're a prison prison imprisoned in themselves. Like, and so I think there's a huge thing around this, the perspective shifts that take place with that. But yeah, anyway, I know that I cut you off earlier when you were about to ask a question. So, Oh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's and So when I did go vegan, my whole relationship with food changed. And that was like a godsend because with bodybuilding, I was dialed in, I was good methodical. And then the minute prep was done, I mean, I'm talking the night the show was over. It was like <laughs> off leash <laughs> and for freaking months. And I had to diet. I had to prep again just to, so I wasn't so fat yeah. and just to get and it's ready. Like, and it's like you see, you see the guys and they have like the burgers and the fries and the pizzas and the ice cream. And it's like the biggest cheat meal slash refeed slash free meal you've ever seen in your life. It's like 10,000 calories and it's like a whole event. Like yeah. people create this whole event out of it, you know? And, and the thing is, is like, I understand it's like a reward mechanism, but I often think it's almost like all this pent up energy yeah. that people have been harboring, like, like, like getting discipline, but really they, they just like want to let loose, you know? And it's like, it's definitely, I, I will tell you, like I had that mentality, like even when I first went vegan, my mindset seven years ago was right. I'm going to get as big and as strong as I can as a vegan. And really, because at the time there wasn't like a lot of really strong vegans. Like they were like more like fitness, like 
fitness category style. Yeah. They weren't like hard, they weren't like bodybuilders. And I was like, you know, well, like I really want to like just push it to the limit, like with what I can do. And I know that for me, I would eat tons of just like fun foods, you know, foods that I enjoyed. But I would use it under this guise or this premise of like, well, I'm going to be doing deadlifts tomorrow. I'm going to be training legs tomorrow. Um, like I just did a really hard leg session. Let me just load up on a ton of carbohydrates. Like I'm glycogen, glycogen loading. And so I would tell myself all these stories about like why I was doing it, but I felt like crap. So like I get like heartburn and reflux and my skin would break out because it was just like processed food. And I would just tell myself, oh, it's just like carb loading, glycogen loading. I'm, you know, and so I had to work through that whole process as well, you know, and it's, it's hard. Like, I think that's a really prevalent thing within the bodybuilding world um, that a lot of people really struggle with their relationship with like working out and overtraining and overeating and they overtrain so that, so they can overeat. And it's like this like sort of self perpetuating, like vicious cycle. Totally. And so I, that's why I admire how much courage it took for you at your level to step away from that. Cause you like, you were at like the top and to step away from that and to be like, to really cultivate a different relationship with food and yourself. That's really challenging for a lot of people. That's, I mean, that's really hard. Like a lot of people, like that's like the stuff that I think a lot of people in the fitness industry hide away. Like that's like almost like the dark secrets of the fitness industry that there's a lot of body dysmorphia and there's a lot of addic like disordered eating patterns. Totally. And I really, and I really feel for them. Like it's not, it's, it's just like, it's, it's, a, it's there's a sympathy there. Cause you're like, man, like these people are good people. And they're really like torturing themselves and they're cutting years off their life, you know, like really like shortening their lives and, and, and all for like things that they probably don't even really value that much when they really think about it, you know? So I, that, that comes back to that whole evolution that you had that so often when people come into a plant-based diet, they really do have these like, like transformations in other areas as well, whether it's like their personal life, they might change careers, they might leave bodybuilding, they get into new things, they get into yoga, they get into other things, they travel. It's just, I feel like it's like this natural progression of that. So it's a beautiful thing to see, you know? Yeah, thank you. It's, yeah. It's been, it's been a beautiful transition. It's been freeing in many ways. And like being off of this, uh, dialed in, eat a lot, dialed in, eat a lot. Like this, this cycle, this yo-yo is gone. Like roller coaster. Wicked bad yeah. roller coaster. And you know how, when you eat a bunch of like sugar, yeah, you're also on a mental roller coaster and your uh -huh. body weight changes. So like, not only are you just stuffing your face, but now I'm 30 pounds heavier than I was a month ago and I'm five yeah. feet tall. That shit doesn't go up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I feel like just so much more even and like peaceful. And I don't want to say it's just because of the bodybuilding diet or just because of the food I was eating, but it's like the whole lifestyle has yeah. totally changed and I don't need to go to the gym. In fact, I haven't, I haven't been to the gym in a while, <laughs> but yeah. even yeah. before quarantine, I would go here and there, but my, I would rather get on my bike and move my body. I would rather go do yoga outside and move my body, not spend three hours. And maybe it's because you know, like you, we, we did very, we have a very similar journey. Three hours in the gym every single day is like, there's so much more to life. Yeah. And there's so and much that you, and there's so, you get to a point where you realize you're missing so much. Yes. You know, like, like, what am I missing by not traveling or not being outdoors or not spending more time with my family or not creating those projects and doing those side passions that I want to do because my whole life is like meal prep, sleep, train. And, and, and work a nine to five job to pay those bills to make that happen. And like, so that's my thinking now is I've become way more intentional. Whereas before I would say, okay, let's just throw everything at this. So early on when I wanted to get a transformation for someone, I'm like, look, let's just ramp up the training volume. Let's just get the volume up because you're going to burn more calories. We'll just create tons of progressive overload with your training. 
Um, we'll try and eat as much as we can. So like when you do need to diet down, you have like a really big substrate of calories to like remove or like to, to, to remove from. And now I'm like the, the opposite. I'm like minimum effective dose. I'm like, what's the minimum amount of training I can do to get the maximum yield? What's the minimum amount of food I can eat to get the maximum response? Um, there's something about that minimalistic concept from not just like a philosophical standpoint, but from like a health perspective where I started to recognize that if I'm training two or three hours a day and I'm eating a ton of calories, that's a lot of work that your body and metabolism is doing. That's aging you faster. You are literally getting closer to your grave quicker. And I thought to myself, like, why would I really want to do that to myself when I want to be around for my daughter as long as I can now? And so I was like, you know what? I can still get in there and train hard and really overload the muscle with what I have. But rather than two hours, let's do 45 minutes. And, and what I found is that I've been able to keep like 80% of my progress by doing like 50% less you know, like, like 60% less, even more. And so by being intentional and it's the same with, with the eating. So now rather than like eating more calories, but then having to train more to offset the high calorie intake, there's a, there's a, I guess a spiritual journey that comes with that. And you kind of touched on that where I feel like once you start to bring other things into your life that bring you value and enjoyment. You don't feel the need to eat all the time. So like if you're out in nature and you're hiking or you're, have you ever felt like, you know what it's like if you've been like at a fit expo and you literally go all day and you don't even really eat anything because you're just like talking to people all day and you're like hanging out and your energy is like through the roof because you're just connecting with people. And it's like, it's like that idea of, what things can I add into my life that generate that type of energy where I don't need to be just eating all day and then I have to train through the roof to offset that high level of eating. And so now I do a lot more intermittent fasting. You know, I'll do a lot more fasting where I can press down my feeding window and I can press down my meals. So like I just have like one or two meals a day. And, and there's all these things that you play with to try and get a minimalistic approach and even a minimalistic approach when it comes to, like your training style and, and supplementation and anything like that. Um, I think honestly, like the more that we can strip away, the better, like very often people are like, Oh, what am I missing? I need to add things in to find like what works for me. And sometimes it's about removing the fluff. You know, it's like, it's like, think of a, I often think of a, like, if you uh, like, you know, if, if you've been driving for a long time, like, like we have, it's, 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 it's automatic for you. You get in the car, you, you almost like go unconscious. You just kind of like, you feel the road. Your movements are very minimal because you're so like at one with the vehicle. And it could be the same with, with yoga. It's the same with even lifting weights. Um, it's the same with uh, martial arts. If you look at like a, a new driver, they're like, they're like looking at every mirror like a hundred times, everything. They're like overdoing everything. And so they're adding a whole lot of extra movements in that they don't need to be doing. And it's often the same with like someone who's new to like lifting weights. They add in like they do a lot of extra things that they shouldn't be doing. And so part of it is like not just looking at things you need to keep adding in, but sometimes you just need to remove so much out of your life. Like you literally need to remove so many, so much excessive movement like all that excessive movement is like mental fatigue. It's distraction. It's taking you away from the core fundamental things that are going to get you most of your results. And so I definitely, you know, really am a big proponent of just this sort of minimalistic approach as much as possible. And I feel like veganism and the whole awareness through veganism, it taught me a lot of that. You know, it taught me a lot of that, 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 and fatherhood, um, the combination of those two things taught me about how can I be, how can I remove things from my life, but make everything else really efficient. So it works. And then I don't have to add other things back into my life because I feel like there's things that are missing. And then I need to fill all these voids in my life, you know, like all these voids that like, I, and that's why people keep defaulting back to like old patterns and habits, you know, old addictions and things, because they try and remove these things, but they never fill them with any new light. They never fill them with anything new. 
And they're like, they're just constantly resisting the old thing. And there's this big hole. Mm. And eventually like that thing just is like a magnet for that hole. And they go back to it, you know? And it's like, I've said that to people when it comes to, to veganism, like get around other vegans, like, or, or do new things, experience new things, go to some vegan restaurants, just immerse yourself in learning and doing new things to fill those old holes. Because if you just try and change your diet, but you're still hanging out with the same crowds, doing the same things, you're going to be pulled back into that again. You know, your environment is, is such a huge part of it in everything. So yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Totally agree with everything you just said. I'm just like, yes, yes, more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited. I feel like you're also reading my mind today. Cause like sometimes I'm like, Oh, I'm going to ask about this next. And then you're like, by the way, intermittent fasting, I haven't eaten yet today. I am. I have been fasting for probably two weeks. Not. That's kidding. cool. Yeah, yeah. I've been really into intermittent fasting and like we have more food, <laughs> we spend more, yeah. less money on food and I feel more sharp. Like I'm more with it. I have yeah. the, this less, less of a need to go pick all the time. Yeah. Um, and like, I want to do like a five day fast. So I, I also want to work up to the more like spiritual type cleansing yeah. fast. Um, but I also do believe in intermittent fasting for so many reasons, because like when our bodies aren't always digesting food, it has more energy to repair our cells, it, uh, like immune cells and digest it in like everything else. And we're so caught up, you know, and again, it, breaking all the old patterns, you must unlearn what you have learned. Thank you, Yoda. Um, eating, like eating every hour, every hour, <laughs> chicken for snacks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you're just like, wow, I, I don't need meat and I don't need a timer on my schedule. So yeah. like, and it's, in fact, it's even more beneficial for you to wait to eat versus just wake up right in the morning and do it. So I'm so excited and you, that and, you said and, that. And have you ever heard, like, I mean, you obviously are much more into yoga than I am, but I've heard, there's a guy called Guru Singh. Have you heard of him before? No. I'm going to have to show you him after this interview. I, you'll love him. Anyway, he, cause he's vegan as well. And um, he talks about this concept around uh, yoga and the teachings around how you want to have space. Like you don't want to be full because being full leaves no room for anything new. And so, and he talks about that regarding space in your body for, with food. So like when you eat, don't just eat till you're full, like eat till you're, you're comfortable, but leave space. And he talks about that space for other things in your life to come out. And I, I never forget it. Cause I was like, man, that's such a cool way to look at it because a lot of people see like hunger or, like, you know, hunger cues or cravings as a negative thing. They're like, I'm hungry. I've got to eat. Oh my God, I'm getting cravings. Oh God, it's such a bad thing. And I'm like, rather than seeing this as a bad thing and then thinking that in your brain, your brain is then telling that you have to go and eat food as a response to this. Can't you step back and recognize that maybe leaving space is a good thing that it's going to teach you sort of discipline and awareness about yourself and awareness that, we got these habits given to us as kids where if we did really well at school or if we scraped our knees, what did our grandparents and parents do? They gave us like a treat. Like if we got, if we did well at school, we got a treat. If we got hurt, we got a treat. I mean, I don't know about you, but like my grandparents did that with us. So then all of a sudden we have these associations with achievement and pain is, is food. Whereas can we sit in that and not do that? And I think fasting, intermittent fasting, for example, or even like extended fasting, there's a real spiritual component to that if you want it to be. And I often think of it from a perspective of like an on and off switch. So like right now, like if I haven't eaten yet, my switch is off, but I have more mental energy. I have more clarity. My, and part of it is like, because you're not constantly triggering your blood, like an insulin response, like blood sugar is not going up and down and up and down because you're eating all the time because unstable blood sugar and in an insulin response massively dictates like mental energy and mental clarity and brain fog and all these things. And so that's why often when people early on, if they fast, they might notice that they're getting a bit more brain fog than normal because they're insulin resistant and their blood sugar is going up and down on that roller coaster and they need to get used to that. It will normalize. Once you normalize, have you noticed that your energy is actually improved when you're in a fasted state? 
because you're, you're becoming more insulin sensitive and your blood sugar is actually getting more stable. And so blood sugar stability and insulin sensitivity is not only just, you know, valuable for like building muscle or fat loss, it's really important in terms of like energy levels and mood. And so a lot of people who have like low, bad energy or like their mood's not good, their insulin, they, they're, they're on that roller coaster. Um, but I love that you're, you're dabbling in the fasting because I feel like that's in alignment with like yoga, spiritual awakening, veganism and all of that stuff. Um, but I do it now just because like you were saying, one minimum effective dose, like you can save money because you're not eating so much food. You can still eat enough calories in your feeding window if you wanted to. Like I was, I've been fasting for years and I've been able to get up to 200. I'm like 190 pounds now. I've been able to get up to 230 pounds and I was still fasting. I was just eating like tons of food in my feeding window. I was still fasting 18 to 20 hours a day. Um, so you can do it. It's, it's not as easy, but you can do it. And so like people that might be listening were like, Oh, I'll lose my gains. No, like as long as you're consuming enough calories, you can, you can do whatever you want. But if you want better mental energy through the morning, like you're going to be doing some podcasts or you're going to do get up and, and, and speak, or you need to like energy, like at your job, then maybe fasting is a good thing. But I definitely feel like there's a, there is a big spiritual component to it. And I, and I really feel like, part of it is just like detaching from this need that we always need food to like quell our emotions or bring us comfort. Like how, like, because food is comfort for a lot of people. A food is comfort for everyone in some capacity um, because it's an, it's a necessity. And so we've been taught it since the start, since we were born. And um, so for me, to kind of step back and see that and know that and then challenge myself to like, Hey, like stick this, this fasting out for a while. You know, like I've done like, you know, one and two day fasts. I haven't gone beyond those, but I have done, I, I fast every day in some capacity. Um, you know, like I always train in a fasted state. Like I never eat before I work out ever. Like I haven't done that in years. Um, and it's just part of how I did things. But I mean, what have you noticed with the fasting? Like what, what compelled you to do it? And what have you noticed so far has been the benefits for you? So uh, what compelled me to do it originally was I just know the benefits of it, like the health benefits. My insides are very thankful right now. And, and my insulin is not all, the, all over the place. Um, control discipline. I love that you said discipline because I feel like with food, we're so instant gratification. And because now we're all at home in front of our fridge. It's harder. It's harder, right? And, and so it's a little element of um, definitely discipline and gaining control over myself. Uh, and there is a, definitely a spiritual component with it too, because I was doing a little bit of yoga research and how they were saying that food can sometimes clog up our, our channel yeah, our connection to the divine. Yeah. And I believe that, especially if you're eating, like, I don't know if you've ever tried to meditate with a full belly or even like working out with a full belly. It's just yeah. like, there's no space for anything yeah. else to come in. And so I definitely, definitely feel more clear. And yeah. when I do go to eat, I get full faster and my choices are better. Yeah. So I've noticed also that I appreciate the foods that I do eat more because mm -hmm. I've spent time being being thinking about them and, and, and wanting them. And so when I do go to eat them, I appreciate the taste of them and I appreciate the way they, the way they satisfy me um, rather than just like wolfing it down and not thinking about it and just eating it from a purely mechanical perspective of like, okay, I'm just eating this, this, and this to build muscle. I'm eating like these things to kind of nourish my body and optimize my health and just, you know, sort of honor this, this temple that we have, um, yeah. you know? And so that's definitely one of the things, you know, talking about honoring temples and things. It's like, I now, especially when it comes to nutrition, like I talk about adding in the rainbow, you know, add in all the different colored vegetables you can get. So like, don't just, don't just eat broccoli every day. You know, don't just eat like one thing every day, like get colorful. Cause you know, those, those colors represent micronutrients, vitamins and minerals. And it's like the more diversity of those things you can get, the more optimal you're going to be. And so when I, that's, that's part of like, you know, honoring that temple and like you look at that food and like all the different colors 
and how they're exploding in the plate. And you can, you have an appreciation for that rather than just, you know, like if you were thinking back to your old days of just like tilapia and broccoli or something, you know, it's like, there's nothing to that. It's just, it's eating for function and it's not, it's just, while it serves a function, I don't think it's like highest function, you know, there's definitely different levels that you can move beyond past that, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I love the temple thing that you said, I think, and, do, it, and it's like notice going through the discipline and staving off from food for a little bit, knowing the benefits that it's giving you when you go to feed your body, you're more conscious of it because you've been kind of in this state where you're fasting. And then when you go to choose yeah. your food, you actually choose it better. And what you said about, so I just learned this recently. I think it's Thich Nhat Hanh. Have you heard of him? That name really rings a bell. It's, he's been on podcasts. He's like this little cute Buddhist monk who's like yeah. older and he's like, I'm so happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he talks about looking at your food and like actually being really grateful for it before you put it into your body. And I think there's actually like scientific evidence saying when we do that to our food, all of the nutrients are absorbed. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you think about it because from a scientific perspective, like if you're calming down your nervous system, Ah. And, you're get, and you're getting out of a sympathetic state and you're getting into a parasympathetic state. Parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system is associated with digestion. And so if you're in a calm state of gratitude and you're in the moment, oh. um, you bring on that digestive part of your nervous system. And so there's, there's real science to that. Yeah. Um, really. And I mean, I think that's a beautiful thing that you mentioned because it's like, it's easy. It's so easy to be caught up in that sort of rush, the rush culture that we find ourselves in where we're just like trying to get to A to B, like A to B every day. And just like rushing through lunch, rushing through the meals, rushing through everything to just get to the end of the day so we can start it all again. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's why for me, it's like we made the decision like, you know, to travel in, in our RV in like two weeks time even when there's still a lot of people staying at home because we're like, I just want to, I want to, I don't want to just be rushing through the days here at home. I want to be out in nature and slowing things down and getting present um, and, and living life you know, living life. And, and you can still train and you can still eat well and do all of those things. You know, you don't have to sacrifice one thing for the other. You just have to find like a good mix of the two for you, you know? Yeah. Yes. And I have like one more, I guess, thing I want to talk about with you. And I don't yeah, know if you do sure. this. How Do you meditate or how is that? Do I you do any kind of practices. So I do. It's, it's a little bit different. So like in the morning when I first get up, I have, if you search on Spotify, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you right now. So on Spotify, there is a playlist called dream catcher oh. and, it, and it's flute music. Oh. And it's like, it plays like this. I'll show you. Yeah. Hopefully it doesn't play on my computer. So it plays like, can you hear it? Yes. And so I'll play that when I first get up uh -huh. and, and I'll just like sit there and I just breathe. Um, before I check social media, before I get on my computer, before I do anything. And I just, I just, I just box breathe. So I nasal breathe, um, nasal breathing, box breathing. And I just listen to that for five or 10 minutes and just really focus on what I, what I want to feel today. Um, and then at the end of that, what I do is I have, it's like a digital vision board. So right now I have my vision board right here. It's this big colorful looking thing, but I have all the pictures from that and I have videos and things on my phone under the heart icon, like the favorite section. And so what I'll do is I'll go into that favorites album and I kind of scroll through it and I watch like videos of like when our daughter was first born or when we were in like one of these beautiful national parks and like the sun's shining through the trees or just different things like that. And I find that looking at those things that I've experienced that generated that feeling, get me back into that state again. And so every morning I do that before I start anything, just because I feel like that really primes your mind to be in the right frame of mind to go out there and handle like life's challenges. 
And then even at certain points in the day, um, once, cause I do this at like 4am in the morning. Like I get up really early to work uh, before our daughter wakes up. So I'll do this really, really early in the morning, but then mid afternoon, once everything is done, if it's not too hot outside, we'll go outside, we'll throw a blanket down on the ground and we'll just lay in the grass and with the trees and just breathe. Um, and we'll try and encourage Zia to do that as well. She's still a bit young. Like she'll do it for a second and then she'll get up and she'll like want us to play. But um, I definitely have found that it, it's a, it's a, everyone's, I guess, meditation styles are a little bit different, you know? So like, I even think that like active meditations. So things like, like going for like a walk, like a hike in nature can be like a form of meditation. Totally. You know, if you're, if you're like, if you're like listening to your breath or, you know, like you're kind of breathing cause you're hiking and you're just like listening to your breath and listening to like the rhythm of your feet moving and you're in nature. Like, I feel like that can be meditation. Um, I'll even tell you that like, even like for me working out can be a form of meditation. So like you probably know back from when you were training, like in the zone, I think that's why a lot of people find so much value in it because from a meditation standpoint, it can help you get present. Like when you're in that, in that moment where you're about to like lift weights, you're not really thinking about a lot of other things, especially if it's like a really hard set, your mind gets like everything gets pushed out of your head. And so I definitely think like there's all these different forms of meditation, you know, but I definitely start the day priming the mind that way. Cause I know that if I don't do that, I feel like, I just feel reactive. You know, I feel more reactive. I feel more stressed. I feel like my nervous system is like more strained, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It definitely yeah. does. And I love primed. I feel like it primes you yeah. for the day. And I love how you said that there are a ton of different ways that you can meditate and walking, like being outside. The way that I love to explain it to people is you lose your mind and you come to your senses. So if you're <laughs> listening to, right. And that yeah. brings you right into the present moment, no matter if you're working out, if you're sitting there listening to your breath, if you're watch, looking at the trees, you're, you're now using just your senses yeah. and anything like that can be a, a, a really beautiful form of meditation. And it doesn't have to be sitting on a rock at the top of a mountain. Like, yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. But walking outside, going for a walk can be just as beneficial. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think find the thing that brings you that feeling that you just said, yeah. you know, like what is, what brings you that feeling? Do that. Um, and don't feel like you have to conform to like some cliche stereotype of meditation. If you don't feel like it works for you, you know, like back, back when, before the, the shutdown happened, um, I would, I would do it in the sauna. So like every day I would spend like 30 minutes in a sauna after my workouts and I would do a lot of stuff. I would do a lot of like just breathing in the sauna and stuff like that. Um, now obviously that's changed, but that's what led me to do just the, the breathing in the lounge when I first get up in the morning instead. So it's just about finding like, you know, your thing. Um, and it changes based on the environment that you're in, you know, but like you can take those skills with you no matter where you go and you just adapt them. Right. Yeah. And you can be in a constant state of meditation all day. Like once you're really practiced at, yeah. at it, you can be driving and be sort of in a state of meditation and be so present. And yeah. I feel like when you're super present, other people kind of want to be around you because you're not up in your monkey brain, stressing them out. You're actually like bringing, bringing them to yeah. actually a higher vibration, a more peaceful vibration. Um, and yeah, the working out, that was like, I think my teacher when I, bodybuilding was like such a beautiful teacher. For me. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was my connection to spirit, to numbers, to all of these things. But I would, in my more, my morning sessions were always so good because I would go, I would kill it for cardio, like high intensity, like you had to transcend just to get through the type of shit I was doing. <laughs> and then yeah. I would work out and pose and go into the sauna and I would sit just the same as you said. Yeah. And it's almost like you're challenged in the heat in a different way than if you were just sitting in a room. So you're physically yeah. challenged and mentally. It's really, really cool, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love that. You know, that's the parts that I do appreciate about the bodybuilding culture, um, that it does teach you a lot of those things if you choose to see it that way. And then the question is, how can you transcend that over to other areas of your life? You know, how can you change it over to other areas and, and adapt that and adapt those perspectives and those disciplines and other things you do? Cause I typically find like for a lot of people who are into fitness, there's most of the other areas of their life are suffering a lot. Um, they're really good at fitness, but they're terrible in many other areas. 
And so how, but so the good thing is, is though, like that you have, and they have those building blocks to be better in all those other areas. They have the, they have the character traits. They just need to prioritize it and have belief that they can do it and have the intention of that. They, they want to do it. Um, and it's, it's, it's like figuring veganism out. It's like anything, you know, you want to have that intention of like, I'm just going to figure this out. You know, I don't really know what it's going to look like straight away. Um, but I'll, I have the, the skill sets and I have the confidence that I can figure it out. So, yeah. Yes. Frazier, I feel like we could probably talk for five hours. So (laughs) I would love, like whatever topic, we're like, oh my God, yes, yes. Yeah. I I would love to have you on again uh, for for whatever topics we didn't cover. I'm sure we could come up with a whole new other thing. I would Um, love that. Yes, me too. Ah, and it's been so cool to connect with you. Now I'm like on the other side of this whole big transition. Um, yeah, I can't is. wait for you to come visit Colorado too. There's cool stuff here. Yeah, I can't <sighs> wait. It looks so beautiful. I mean, every time you post pictures and stuff, everyone's jealous. Everyone's like, oh man. Sorry, guys. I, I only go there in my, in my dreams. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? So, but, but I mean, it, it reminds me a lot of New Zealand. Um, mm. And I just, it just, I just love how, like you were saying, like everyone seems active there and like everyone just does their thing and act at being active is like a part of their lifestyle. So it's not something you have to think about. It's just something that they do. And so there's no judgment there because everyone's doing it and everyone's just kind of in their zone. And I love that. And that's like, I want to be part of stuff like that. You know, yeah. it's that environment, you know, like diets, one thing, training is another thing, but the, your environment is a huge part of your health and success with your body and transformation in general. So but it's been a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure coming on and just talking about all kinds of stuff. Yes, I agree. I agree. So where can people find you? So they can find me if they search uh, at Evolving Alpha on Instagram and on Facebook, Evolving Alpha, um, www.evolvingalpha.com. And then just search Fraser Bailey, F-R-A-S-E-R-B-A-Y-L-E-Y on Facebook. I'm on there as well. So those are the places that you can find us. Ah, amazing. Cool. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Fraser, And thank, thank you, everybody, you. for listening. This has been thank a pleasure. You. Okay. Peace, everybody. See you on the next one. See you guys later. <laughs>